Awesome. So we do have a good number of teams on now. So if you want to get started, we'll probably have another one join, you know, as, as they okay. get settled. Sounds good. All right. So I'll start. So um, for those of you that I haven't met, I'm Kathy Nellis. I'm one of the um, transplant hepatologists on um, at Georgetown. So um, I'll probably work with some of you at some point during your, your three years here. Um, so we'll talk about liver transplantation. Oops. Let's see. Advance the slides here. Okay, so learning objectives, um, recognizing the indications for transplant, particularly when to refer to hepatology, recognizing major contraindications, and then familiarity with the um, transplant process and kind of outcomes. Um, so this is the outline. So we'll kind of go through intro, history, prognosis, and how we um, use the MELD score and other things to um, figure out when to refer. Um, indications, contraindications, workup listing, how meld exception points and HCC work, living donor, what it's like to be on the wait list, and then in terms of kind of from the patient's perspective, organ allocation, organ offers, organ quality, the transplant itself, and then post-transplant outcomes. So we'll come back to this, but um, this is just a question in terms of which patient should be considered for a liver transplant. And it's okay if you aren't sure about some of these. Um, it was kind of made intentionally vague, but the point for this slide is if you aren't sure, just refer to us. We would rather have people referred early, even if it's they're too early or, or not candidates, rather than not be referred and kind of wish that they had been. So just some background statistics. So um, there's approximately 633,000 patient adults in the US with cirrhosis. So it's a prevalence of about 0.27%. Um, and then worldwide autopsy studies suggest a prevalence of about 4.5 to 9.5%. So that estimates about 50 million people worldwide with cirrhosis. Um, it's the ninth leading cause of death in the United States. It's about 35,000 deaths per year or about 1.2% of all the deaths in the US per year. Whereas acute liver failure is much more rare, um, about 2,000 cases per year in the U.S., and the mortality is about um, 30 to 50% of those cases. So how do we prognosticate liver disease? It's very difficult just because chronic liver disease is very variable in terms of what that means. So if you have a patient with cirrhosis, whether they're compensated versus decompensated may, means um, a significant difference in terms of what that survival may look like. And even within decompensated patients, someone that has ascites versus someone that's had a variceal hemorrhage is very different. And then same thing with jaundice. So if your bilirubin is 5 versus 25, that's completely different um, kind of prognostices. In terms of tumors, if you have one small HCC versus multifocal HCC, very different. Um, and so we estimate prognosis in terms of figuring out who to refer to transplant and when they're listed for transplant, when and what priority, but it's, it's not a perfect system. So patients always ask in clinic, what stage of cirrhosis do I have? Really what they mean by that is how much time do they have? What's their survival? So we don't usually use this, this staging system much, but it can be helpful to kind of explain um, the difference to patients between compensated and decompensated cirrhosis and kind of what the um, mortalities are, are between the different stages. So stage one, this is according to like a, oh, sorry, um, a research paper, no varices, no ascites, one year mortality, 1%. Varices that have not bled um, with no ascites, 3%. Then we move into decompensated stage three, ascites with or without varices, 20%, and then stage four, bleeding with or without ascites, 57% mortality. So this kind of makes sense to patients when they're asking like what stage, what, how much time do I have? Like they usually can, can grasp this pretty easily. In terms of survival of cirrhosis, so on the left, we have just a graph uh, in the kind of green is, the, is compensated, decompensated uh, in this kind of purpley pink. One year survival is not significantly different um, overall. And this is, again, lumping all, all types of patients into the decompensated and compensated groups um, versus five years, 66 versus 45%. Now, if you throw in SBP, that's going to reduce your survival and then certainly type one HRS. Um, so again, this is a very heterogeneous group, very difficult to really make conclusions, but th this is kind of all comers. And then same thing here, you have all patients with cirrhosis, whether they're compensated or not, median survival is nine years. Once you get to decompensated, the median survival is about 1.6 years. So we used we used to use the child Turco Pew score to try to get at um, kind of 
giving a numerical quantification because the the prior um scales they don't really they give you kind of binary um stages but not like a um like a spectrum or range of, of scores so you've probably seen this before so you have class a b and c and you get points for um um each of these so ascites bilirubin albumin pt um and encephalopathy and then you can calculate the the number of points in each class and figure out what what class they are um and then here you have the um survival so class a generally these people are compensated they have good um overall survival versus class c one year survival is 45 percent two year 35 percent problem with this is you have ascites and encephalopathy which are both fairly subjective. Um, so if you have a patient with ascites, what does slight versus moderate mean? Does that mean, you know, like how do you figure account for getting paracentesis? What if they they had it, had ascites previously, but they're on diuretics and they're doing their low sodium diet and it's controlled, but it's not gone? Like what, what does that actually mean? Same thing with encephalopathy. So the grades of encephalopathy are fairly um, clear cut, but wh where do you put someone in encephalopathy? Like if they if they kind of have chronic low grade, but then they, they have kind of um, flares and, and are hospitalized, like how, how do you classify that? So the CTP score in terms of prognosis and also for organ allocation is very subjective. So then we switched to using the MELD score. So it was developed at Mayo. It was actually developed by IR to try to predict um, risk and mortality of TIPS. And you don't need to know the formula, but just the components of the original. So creatinine, bilirubin, and INR. And INR is the most heavily weighted, followed by creatinine, followed by bilirubin. It can range numerically from six to 40. So all of us, assuming we have healthy livers, all automatically have a, a MELD score of six. Um, and then patients on dialysis are assigned a creatinine of four. They use a pediatric version called the PELD, similar, but it account, accounts for growth failure as well. So it takes into the account their height and weight as well. Um, and this was formally adopted for transplant prioritization in 2002. Formerly, we, we did use CTP, again, knowing that that was somewhat subjective, as well as a hospitalization status. So is the patient at home? Are they in the hospital on the floor? Are they in the ICU? And so um, there was you know, considerable um, potential to kind of game the system and, and put people in the ICU so that they would have higher priority and then wait list time. So now we use MELD. Um, and you've probably seen these graphs before as well, but this is the, the three month survival um, curve based on MELD. So the um, um, likelihood of survival um, uh, goes down, you know, right, right around um, uh, 30, it, it gets down to about 70% um, and then obviously kind of drops off um, very quickly. And then this is just the, the kind of reverse um, likelihood of, of um, death you know, greater than 40 is, is above 80%. Um, but MEL doesn't account for sodium. And so hyponatremia is known to have um, also a negative prognostic um, value. And so they've been, they've done uh, modeling studies kind of looking at this. And if you have the um, serum sodium versus kind of increased risk of death between 125 and 137, you have an increased risk. And then it kind of, you, you kind of get this, um, uh, J shape where it starts to go back up. Um, and so this was um, factored into the MELD score um, starting in 2016 is when it was adopted by UNOS. And so again, here's the formula. You don't need to memorize this, but just kind of for your um, awareness of how it's it's done. In order to obtain um, a MELD sodium score, the, the patient's regular MELD is calculated first, and that has to be greater or equal to 12. So if you have a MELD score of six, or, 6 through 11, it doesn't matter how high your, or low your sodium is, it's not going to be counted. Um, and then depending on how the uh, degree of severity, so the, the sodiums are entered in between 125 and 137, whatever they are, but then greater than 130. 38 um, or less than 125 um, are going to be rounded up to the, the nearest um, interval. So you don't get extra points if you're 124 versus like 120 versus 115. That, that does not reflect in the score. It goes in as a 125. Um, and this is just a graph showing kind of like how the, the meld sodium score impacts your um, what your meld score is based on what your, your native meld score is, what your sodium is. So this is just kind of a numerical um, formulation of that. So the problems with this, um, 
you know, the incorporating the sodium is better than not, but the INR um, is still, you know, it, it doesn't account for patients who are on Coumadin. So people with uh, cardiac disease um, or AFib, that type of thing um, does not account for it. And then it uses a total bilirubin rather than the direct. So patients that have hemolysis or have gotten frequent blood transfusions, um, their MEL will bump just from the indirect component. And then patients can be sicker than their MELD. Again, the MELD is 100% objective because it's only numerical lab scores, but it doesn't account for the patients with ascites, variceal hemorrhage, encephalopathy. So the same reason that we don't use the CTP score is one of the limitations of the MELD is that these are somewhat more subjective things, but we have low MELD patients with these things who are very sick and um, admitted frequently and such. Um, you probably all know... Uh, a classic example of that, someone with a melt of 18 that is far sicker than that. Um, so there's no really great perfect prognostication system or organ allocation system, but this is kind of the one that we use. So why do we consider transplant? We know that cirrhosis has a high mortality rate. We can treat cirrhosis kind of depending on the cause. Um, we, we have, you know, a lot of different treatment options available, but generally cirrhosis is not reversible. Sometimes by treating cirrhosis, if they're decompensated, you can um, have them recompensate, particularly um, patients with hep C um, who are treated, they can recompensate. Same with um, alcohol patients who are um, achieve sobriety, sometimes they can recompensate, um, but many do not, no matter what you do with them. Um, and these patient, patients are in and out of the hospital. They have a poor quality of life. And even compensated patients that you're kind of following can develop HCC, they can decompensate about 5% per year. So I kind of tell patients, you know, it's kind of like having, it's, it's almost like a ticking time bomb. Like you don't know when you're gonna switch from compensated to decompensated and that can be kind of completely unpredictable, but it's always a risk. And so transplant can address and solve all of that. So that's why we, um, any, any patient with cirrhosis, we, we think about transplant in. This is just a timeline of transplantation just for um, reference. So 1954, first kidney, um, first liver was attempted in dogs in 1958, in humans um, was attempted um, in Denver 1963, but the recipient died. The first successful uh, transplant was um, four years later. Um, that's Starzl's picture below. Um, and then over time, we've gotten better. So cyclosporine was approved in 1983. That significantly improved survival due to rejection. Living donor, the first living donor was done in 1989. Uh, Prograph mycophenolate were approved. And then the first adult to adult living donor transplant was 1998. So not that long ago. So one of the questions we get is, what meld should I refer for transplantation? And this is, this is kind of a um, graph of hazard ratio versus, of, of transplant versus meld score. So you can see meld 6 to 11, the hazard ratio of transplant is, is high. Um, and then as you get into the, the um, 12 to 14 range, you're getting around the 50%. And then 15 or, and um, higher is um, when you're going to start to see, um, you know, uh, lower risk of mortality with transplant rather than not. So people in the six to 11 are gonna do better just with their native livers and kind of ongoing care. People 12 to 14 and plus are the ones that we wanna refer for transplant. These are the ones that get the most benefit. That being said, we recommend referring for transplant for any of the following. So MELD, um, the literature says 15. Some people actually argue MELD of 10 or a CTP score of, of seven but really any MELD score with worsening liver function or kind of poor quality of life, if they have any type of hepatic malignancy. And then at whether, regardless of their MELD, if they are decompensated, they should be um, considered for transplant. So if they have ascites, variceal hemorrhage, encephalopathy or jaundice, they should be referred for transplant. And cirrhosis is not a requirement for transplant. So we will transplant patients that have liver disease without cirrhosis. PSC is a very common one, polycystic liver disease, chronic DILI without cirrhosis. Those are all things that we, uh, amongst others, that we transplant that are not actually um, cirrhotic patients. So three factors that I think about when I see a patient in, in clinic with cirrhosis, do they need a transplant? Do they have indications for it? Are they safe for a transplant, meaning um, do they have any contraindications or are they too sick to benefit? And if so, then do they actually have viable access to organs? So how am I going to get this patient transplanted based on their meld, their blood type, 
their body size, whether they have living donor options, and do they qualify for melt exception points. So these are the things that um, we're kind of thinking about in clinic or, or in the inpatient setting when we see a patient in terms of um, transplant candidacy. Um, so this is a table um, just of indications for liver transplant, and I won't read all of these, but basically you have acute liver failure, failure you have complications of cirrhosis, um, metabolic conditions arising from the liver that have systemic manifestations, and then systemic complications from chronic liver disease, so hepatopulmonary and portopulmonary. And then on the right is just a graph um, of basically um, why patients are transplanted. So you have um, um, hep C was uh, high at 24%, ALF low at 4%, alcohol 18%, um, and then, and so on, me metabolic being very low. Now, this is from 2013. If we did this graph in 2021, we might have a much higher percentage of alcohol, and the percentage of, of hep C would be far lower than 24%. Um, etiologies, so um, chronic non-cholestatic liver disease, so viral hepatitis, autoimmune hep, alcohol, particularly if they aren't recovering with abstinence, cholestatic diseases, um, P PBC and PSC in particular, uh, biliatresia we see in, in children, um, PFIC and, and cystic fibrosis are, are more commonly uh, pediatric diagnoses, but sometimes we transplant them as adult. Um, metabolic diseases, um, so some cause cirrhosis directly, so alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is, is a um, Nice example of that, Wilson's NAFLD, hereditary hemochromatosis, and then others, glycogen storage disease, versus some that don't actually cause liver damage, but they cause um, extrahepatic issues due to um, uh, liver um, genetic deficit. So amyloid, primary hyperoxaluria, that actually causes kidney renal failure from oxaluria stones, but the problem is overproduction in the liver. Same with urea cycle deficits, organic acidemias. Liver malignancy, so HCC commonly, uh, hyalurcholangio. Um, we do rarely do other things, hepatoblastoma, that's usually kids, fibrolamellar HCC in younger adults, um, HEHE, which is extremely rare, and then rarely um, adenomatosis. Fulminant hepatic failure, so these will be your patients that you see in the unit, um, Tylenol and other DILI, Hep B, Hep A, Amanita, Wilson's, others, and then some kind of um, miscellaneous that don't really fit into a category, so Budchiari, metastatic neuroendocrine tumors. Lately, um, there's been a trend toward metastatic colon cancer if the Mets are only in the liver, polycystic liver disease, drug-induced liver injury. Um, so these are kind of the main reasons that we um, do transplant. Contraindications, so brain death in any patient, this is most relevant in ALF, um, brainstem herniation as well. So predictors of this uh, high intracranial pressure greater than 50, those patients are generally not gonna wake up from um, surgery. And then low cerebral perfusion pr pressure, same thing, very, very unlikely that they're gonna recover regardless of transplant. Anatomical abnormalities are, are very, very rare nowadays, um, but they, they can be um, an issue. AIDS, um, if they have full-blown AIDS with low CD4 or AIDS-defining illnesses, that's a contraindication. HIV on heart is not contraindicated. Uncontrolled sepsis or other infections, um, severe cardiac or pulmonary disease, and then active extrahepatic malignancy. So these, these ones here on this slide are kind of really across the board, across the nation, any, any center, like they're not going to do patients with with these things. Some of the next ones are a little bit more relative. So ongoing um, illicit drug use is generally a no, but some centers will actually refuse pa patients that smoke tobacco at all. They make them quit. Ongoing alcohol abuse, that's, that's um, very center dependent. Um, there's been a trend, and you guys have probably seen this, toward doing more acute alcoholic hepatitis patients versus um, delaying them six months, but center dependent. Severe uncontrolled psychiatric illness. So this is not like your general kind of run of the mill depression that someone's on like Lexapro for or, or anxiety where maybe they're on clonopin. This is, this is severe, like things that are not gonna be able to be controlled. So schizophrenia, re repeated hospitalizations, that's basically kind of not manageable. Relative is extensive thrombosis of the superior mesenteric or portal vein. We do have ways um, at our center that we, we can do tips and try to open these people up, but not every center can. And so um, patients at other centers may be denied because of that. Non-compliant, so if you have someone that doesn't do what they're told um, pre-transplant, they're not gonna um, do well post-transplant. 
severe malnutrition or debility and frailty, lack of psychosocial support. Advanced age is another one that's very center dependent. It kind of depends on the patient. You can have a 71 year old that's old versus a 71 year old that's young. Um, and you can have, you know, six year olds that are old versus young. So that's kind of relative to the patient. And then morbid obesity, um, we don't love to do, but at this center, it's not a hard uh, contraindication. At some centers, they have BMI cutoffs. Others do not. Some will, will recommend um, bariatric surgery at the time of transplant or, or following. Um, but this is very um, center specific. So what you see at Georgetown may not be what is done at the next hospital that you um, go to. So where do our referrals come from? So in the inpatient, it's almost always other hospitals. Rarely do we get someone that comes to the Georgetown ER or is admitted from like a, a clinic in Georgetown that ends up going to transplant. There are almost always other hospitals calling to transfer. In the outpatient, most of our referrals come from community gastroenterologists. About 20% are our own patients where we are referred patients and um, we recognize that they need transplant and so we'll, we'll kind of self-refer them to ourselves. Um, less commonly, um, IR, oncology, or surgery will be referred someone that they think is um, more suitable for transplant. Usually not from PCPs. I've never had a PCP um, refer directly to, from tra to transplant. They, they generally refer to a specialist first, either a local GI or directly to hepatology, and then we figure out kind of um, whether they're transplantable or not. Um, the transplant eval team, so the patient meets the entire team um, in the outpatient setting, generally all the same day. On the inpatient setting, um, people kind of um, meet them at their convenience, but you can see you have, a, you know, the patient family at the center, hepatology, anesthesia, surgery, PharmD, uh, the nurse coordinator, they'll also meet the living donor coordinator, social work, um, and then finance and research. So the process, the, the point of doing a transplant eval is to make sure that A, they would derive benefit from transplant and assess kind of their severity of illness, but more so to kind of exclude comorbid medical or psychosocial issues, which would reduce benefit. Um, so again, that can be done in the inpatient or outpatient setting, um, but the family or, or close friends have to participate. So a patient um, can't just kind of be doing this alone. That's generally a, a very, um, uh, large red flag that they don't have social support. Um, so that's kind of how it works. They, in the outpatient setting, they get educated um, the morning of, on the inpatient side, they, they watch like a PowerPoint in their, in their room, but they're given education on what it's like to go through transplant, what the kind of recovery and post-transplant course is and, and such. Then they meet the transplant team and then we do the testing um, and workup, which we'll go into next. Um, and then they're discussed at the selection committee um, at the, the, usually these are done on Tuesdays and it's a kind of a group input and decision. Most of the patients um, we end up either listing or more, more commonly they're not quite ready to list. They still need uh, testing, but kind of pending that the testing is, is done, um, probably 60 to 70% of these patients get listed. And this is because we, you know, most of our referrals are coming from gastroenterologists that recognize kind of ind indications for transplant and, and the other kind of 20% are coming from ourselves. So we, we're pretty good at figuring out who is appropriate for transplant versus not. Um, so um, so that's, that's the majority. In some patients, we may end up following them, kind of deciding um, what to do, depending how, how they do. Um, less commonly, we will um, say, no, either due to contraindications, other options. Um, so sometimes they'll be referred for, if they have an HCC, we'll refer for hepatectomy or, or refer to oncology. Um, we can continue following them in hepatology um, if we don't think that they're appropriate due to just contraindications. Um, or they can be referred to a, another center for a second opinion. Um, sometimes patients are too early, so they'll be referred without really any decompensations and a, and a low meld. Um, and, and that's fine. We would rather have that than, than too late. So usually those patients, we, we say, okay, you're not really ready for transplant yet, but keep following because it's possible that you'll, you'll worsen and need it. Um, so again, just trying to figure out, will they benefit? So you really have to balance um, the patient's comorbidities, their psychosocial factors, their risks versus the risk of dying and not getting uh, transplanted and the, the kind of quality of life from not transplanting. But then also societal factors. So trying to, you know, um, 
balance justice and utility and, um, you know, allocating organs to patients who are going to most need and kind of most derive benefit from. So that that's a very nuanced and can be very tricky to really kind of um, figure out that balance. Um, so the workup, so this is kind of a long slide, sorry, but they basically, usually they start with the hepatologist and we kind of go through what, what their indications, do they have contraindications, um, often figuring out, do they need any additional testing? Do they need to go to cardiology or pulmonary or ID or anyone else um, that we need to kind of get that ball rolling? They get a bunch of labs drawn. So they do a whole serological workup just to confirm the etiology of disease. Every now and then we find um, etiologies that you know, patients are labeled as cryptogenic and they're, they're clearly not and such, um, and to exclude kind of concurrent etiologies. They get meld labs, blood type, tumor markers, uh, quantiferon, and then they get um, kind of viral serologies um, just for immunity and um, as well as kind of post-transplant monitoring for things like CMV and EVV. They all need contrasted imaging, either a triple phase CT or an MRI. The reason for that is A, looking for HCC or other tumors, but um, also to an assess their anatomy and their vasculature, um, particularly looking at the portal vein and making sure that there's not a portal vein thrombosis. That's something that the surgeons need to know about ahead of time rather than kind of being surprised by that. They get a chest X-ray, EKG. They do a resting echo with bubble um, to assess for portopulmonary hypertension and uh, hepatopulmonary syndrome. So they're looking at the um, LVEF, the RVSP, the valve function, and whether they have delayed bubbles. And then depending on their age and, and risk factors, um, usually a DSC, sometimes they'll get a CT of their coronaries as well, or a cardiac cath kind of depends on the, on the patient. Um, they all need up-to-date malignancy screening, so depending on their age, um, kind of usual age-appropriate things. If they have an extensive smoking history, then we'll do a CT chest as well. Dental clearance, um, this is kind of center-specific. Some, some centers make everyone get it, and others kind of, if they clearly have poor dentition, then yes. Um, it also um, can vary by insurance, but that's something that you may see. And then bone density, same thing. And then others, depending on kind of what the, the patient um, other, other medical conditions. Um, patients that are foreign born will see infectious disease. And that's just mainly to um, figure out what additional serological testing they need. Not that that would exclude them from transplant, but for things that we need to kind of um, know to monitor for in the post-transplant setting. So that's kind of like the workup. So it's a lot of different things. It's a lot of um, hoops for patients to jump through, particularly when they're sick. So very sick patients sometimes will admit to just get this done in a um, more rapid manner. And then as far as what happens next, so if they're listed, they're listed by their MELD score and blood type. So we actually have four different lists based on blood type. Um, they're recorded in Otter, and then they're notified of listing with a, um, like a snail mail letter. They have to get labs drawn, um, recertified to be entered into unit um, based on the, the acuity of their, their MELD score. So, um, you know, lower scores less, less frequently. They still, while they're on the um, wait list, they still need HCC screening every six months or Q3 if they actually have HCC. Um, and on these, we always do MRIs or CAT scans. We do not use ultrasound um, on uh, listed patients. It's just not sensitive enough. If they're waiting for more than a year, then they have to repeat um, their DSE or cardiac stress test. And then they still have to stay up to date on other things. So like malignancy screening and then variceal screening, which we generally take care of. They can be dual listed, two different centers. That's perfectly legal. And depending on the, the patient, sometimes we encourage it. Usually insurance will cover a second um, center, but some, sometimes they can be finicky and will only let them go to certain um, places. Usually it's in a geographically similar area. So for a place, a hospital like Georgetown, common places that we dual list are Hopkins, VCU, and then programs in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, just because those are kind of geographically not that far from us. But there are no rules on distance. So I have um, patients that have been listed, um, you know, in, in programs that require a several hour flight um, apart. So there's not, um, no, no rules on that, but the patient has to be able to get there. So I actually have a guy that's dual listed in Florida, and he um, has like a an agreement with a private charter um, jet that if he gets an organ offer, then you know the jet's going to pick him up and and fly him here. Um, but that's on the patient, so that's not anything that the transplant center is going to pay for. So they have to be able to figure out how to get there in time. Usually, dual listing is patients with low meld that don't have living donors and they're just kind of really stuck. They're not going to be able to get done realistically, and so 
being listed in a different center, different area can, can sometimes help. Uh, less so now that we do, um, there's, now that there's differences in how we allocate organs, but previously this was, was more helpful for some patients. And then MELD exception points. So th this is designed to try to get patients transplanted when the MELD isn't reflecting their, their severity of illness, um, basically to try to um, reach them before they become too ill. So there's automatic and then there's petition. So automatic, you have to document certain criteria. You submit that to UNOS and it's, it's um, like pretty much instantaneous, pretty like it's computerized. Petition, that's actually kind of, you're essentially writing a letter more or less kind of begging to the National Liver Review Board to ask for points. And you can ask for however many points you, you want and they may or may not um, grant it. They, basically, it's a committee of people. They review it. They can um, approve. They can deny. And if they do approve, they can, they can give you whatever MELD score they, they choose. So it's not um, a standard thing. Um, these are some examples of, of things for you where you can get automatic MELD exception points. So HCC within Milan or downstage, there's very strict criteria on hyalur cholangia that we don't really have time to get into like all the criteria, but patients that meet those can um, get that hepatopulmonary syndrome, particularly when their PaO2 is less than 60, but um, has to be greater than 50. Greater than 50, they are excluded from transplant. Portopulmonary, if their mean um, PA pressure can be brought down to less than 35 with medications. Cystic fibrosis, that you have to documentate, uh, document that they have the mutation um, and then low FEV1. And then some other um, genetic things, um, primary hyperoxaluria, FAP, you have to prove that they have the, uh, these gene mutations. And then HAT, so hepatic artery thrombosis post-transplant um, on days eight to 14, there are specific lab criteria that they have to meet, um, but if they do, they get an automatic MELD exception point. Whereas petitioning is, again, it's, it's much more subjective. Instead of a computer, you have a human um, that's, that's kind of reviewing this and deciding. Um, so things that you can more likely to be successful to petition for, certain types of bud chiari if they've failed TIPS and anticoagulation, um, HEHE, which is a rare um, uh, hemangioendothelioma, Rarely um, hepatic hydrothorax. I don't know if any of you took care of Sue before she died. That was one of Dr. Ragnikar's patients. He was able to get her MELD exception points based on how many thoras that she needed. HHT, very rare, but um, can be submitted. Hepatic adenomas, particularly if they're not resectable or if they have malignant transformation, metastatic neuroendocrine tumors, polycystic liver disease, PSC, recurrent cholangitis. They have to have... Um, meet pretty strict criteria for this. And then um, a donation after cardiac death organ. So someone that's been transplanted that has ischemic cholangiopathy from that. Um, so these are things that if, if they have one of these things, you're more likely to, to um, get the, the points. But again, it's, it's not an automatic thing. Um, whereas this stuff on the right, your um, ascites, I don't think um, they, they pretty much never do. Same with hyponatremia because these things are reflected in the MELD score. So someone with ascites is on diuretics, that they should, you should see that in, this, in the sodium and the creatinine. Hepatic encephalopathy, same thing, recurrent GI bleeding. Small for size, that's a post-transplant issue. Um, it's usually not, but it kind of depends on the situation. So you can try. Chronic rejection, no, because you'll have that reflected in the MELD score. Late hepatic artery thrombosis, uh, usually not, but can be. And then pruritus is one that you can always try and you're basically writing a letter saying why this person's quality of life is terrible and you know that they've failed all their um, kind of standard medication uh, therapies, but um, it's, it's again, subjective and so generally has not been uh, granted. Um, so again, this is very strict criteria and it's, um, you can always try, but it's, it's often not successful. And then moving on to HCC. So, you know, transplanting for this, the patient needs to be unresectable. So if they have um, more than one lesion or they have portal hypertension, then they're not going to be a good candidate for surgery. So um, patients with compensated cirrhosis without portal hypertension, one lesion, we can often just resect and not need to transplant. To get no exception point, they have to have a T2 lesion. That means greater than or equal to two centimeters. But they also have to be within Milan criteria, which are um, listed here. And the tumor cannot be ruptured. So ruptured tumors are far more likely to spread and seed. And so that would um, exclude them. If the AFP is greater than 1,000, then they have to um, 
undergo treatment and then it needs to be under 500 and you have to submit that to UNOS. Patients outside Milan can be downstaged um, generally through um, IR. Well, usually it's uh, taste that they do here. Other centers do tear, RFA, um, other things, and then they can receive exception points. Uh, there's not like a hard cutoff on like what outside Milan um, can be can be done. Um, generally, fewer um, number of tumors and smaller size generally tends to do better compared to um, severe multifocal HCC, but there's, there's not like a hard cutoff for that. Um, and the point of transplant, so by transplanting these patients, you know, assuming they don't have vascular invasion, so if you see, you know, tumor in vein, that they're done, but you're going to get automatic, automatically, just by removing the entire liver, you're going to get negative margins. Um, and then you're, you reduce the risk of recurrence. So if you take out the entire cirrhotic liver, the, the risk of recurrence is, is far less than, you know, um, resecting, um, you know, a, a lobe of someone's liver, but the, the underlying cirrhosis is still there. The risk is um, of developing a second HCC is 50%. So that's why we do it. And the outcomes are generally pretty good. What about living donors? So the recipient of a living donor has to be evaluated and they have to be deemed appropriate for a deceased donor. So if they have contraindications and they're not gonna be um, considered for a living donor kind of regardless. The donor evaluation and all the testing that the donor needs is paid for by the recipient's insurance. The donors have to contact us themselves. So the patient can't do it. The patient's family can't do it. It has to be whichever donor is, is potentially interested needs to reach out. We can't call them. So patients um, are given information on kind of how to talk to their relatives and friends about living donation, and then they have to call us. So living donor transplant, most ideal for patients with low meld, um, long, likely to have a long wait time, ideally without severe uh, portal hypertension or, if, they, or if, uh, have, if they've had a TIPS, then that can help. And generally only need a liver. So patients that need a liver kidney, that's not really going to work because they're not going to get a kidney from a living donor. Um, the eval, so um, first they start with a phone screening they just talk with one of the nurses. If they know their blood type, um, that can you know, end it right there if they're not a match, um, their height and weight, their medical history and what their motivation is. And then they meet with um, a transplant team as well as psychology. They get very similar work up to what a recipient gets, um, just looking for any um, um, clotting abnormalities as well as any evidence of underlying chronic liver disease. And sometimes we actually find people, we, I found uh, NASH in, in patients, autoimmune hep, so um, that can actually happen. Then they get um, imaging to look at their vasculature as well as the um, biliary tree, and then to look at their liver volumes as well as steatosis, making sure they have no lesions, nothing else. Um, cardiac workup, similar, um, age-appropriate cancer screenings. And many of the, probably, probably about 75% of the, the donors are excluded because we find either a medical reason or an anatomical reason that they can't donate. Um, Criteria, this is very, very center specific. So our age is 18 to 55. Um, I don't think any centers would consider like a 17 year old, but whether um, you can push to kind of 60, 65, that, that's center specific. And it, that can be relative. Again, um, age of a, of a person is a number and it kind of depends on, you know, other things as well. They have to be in good health. Um, they can't have chronic medical conditions. And if they do, then it, it needs to be kind of one or two things that are controlled, like hypertension on a beta blocker, and that's it. Um, they, they cannot be overweight. Sometimes if they are, we'll make them uh, lose weight and then reassess. They can't be doing alcohol, drugs, um, tobacco, we discourage, but it's not a hard no here. They have to be motivated for kind of the appropriate reasons. So they can't be under any type of coercion that's illegal, any financial or um, gain that that's also illegal. And there shouldn't be secondary gain. So there shouldn't be like, you know, I want to be off from work for a couple of weeks because I'm burned out. So let me just do this. Like that's not going to um, go well either. And then same with the psychological pressure. So, you know, um, often patients will have a, a, um, like a, a child that maybe wants to donate and then the spouse of the patient is really pushing them and that that's not okay either. So it needs to be from the donor um, themselves and they need to have the right reasons. And then they still have to have social support the same way uh, um, the recipient does. They need to be able to take off from work. They need to have uh, financial stability. The donor, um, the, the insurance for the recipient will cover the donor costs up to the first three months, but sometimes they have complications um, past that. So they have to have their own insurance as well.
Um, and then again, um, they're selected, they're discussed at the selection committee and group decision to kind of proceed or not. So that's kind of how living donor evals work. Uh, in the sake of time, I'm going to skip this. I'll just tell you that these, um, the top four patients are reasonable to kind of think about transplant. Um, 79 is a, a bit old. Um, that's not a, a hard no, but six HCCs, which are large, is. Um, and then ischemic hepatitis and cardiogenic shock is not um, a good etiology for ALF. Um, again, refer rather than not. Okay, so moving on, we'll talk about the wait list organ allocation, uh, the actual transplant operation, and the kind of outcomes. So again, they're listed um, by blood type. Um, they're um, getting labs at intervals. They're continuing to see us. Um, they, they have to see whichever hepatologist they are following with regularly. Usually it's at least every three months. It kind of depends on how sick the patient is. Um, if they're not that ill, then we'll do every six, but we generally like to keep a, a tight rein on them. They may or may not see their local referring GI. It kind of depends on the patient. Some of them have a relationship with them and they're closer kind of geographically. Um, others don't ever want to see that person again. So it kind of just depends. We usually just ask the patient what they want. Um, again, they're getting their HCC screening, um, endoscopies, stress tests, um, up to date on everything. As far as what happens on the wait list, so they can have four different outcomes. So they, they can get transplanted. They can die. They can remain active on the wait list and they can um, either be active or they can remain on the wait list as status seven, which you may have seen in um, caring for patients, particularly in the unit when you rotate through the unit. Um, often our waitlisted patients will be um, made status seven. So they're on the wait list, but they're just inactive. And it's just basically they're too ill to be transplanted. So um, often these are patients who are intubated, non, not for HE, but for you know true pulmonary reasons, sepsis, septic shock, on pressure anyone that's too sick to survive a surgery that shouldn't go to the OR imminently should be made status seven. Um, less commonly, they'll be too well. So I have some patients that have very low MELs. They want to travel pre-COVID. They're not going to be in town. They're not interested. Some of these patients want to be made status seven um, rather than delisting and kind of see what happens and then figure that out later. So sometimes too well. Or if you have something new that kind of um, is concerning. So let's say you, you see new lymphadenopathy on someone's scan and you're worried they have a malignancy, then you're going to make them status seven while that's getting sorted out. Um, less commonly, but it can happen, is that they're lost to follow up and they stop getting what they're, um, the tests that they need done. So that's kind of status seven. And then um, they can be reactivated depending on you know, when is appropriate versus delisted. That's a more permanent thing. So if you delist someone, then if you want to relist them, you have to kind of start all over and go through the process again. Um, so that's generally um, someone that has like an irreversible contraindication. So often active malignancy, new heart failure, or like a um, debilitating stroke or kind of um, possibilities for that. Rarely the patient's too well. Kind of the most common we see with this is someone that has had you know, severe alcoholic hepatitis, but has ended up recovering with sobriety and their MELD gets down to like seven or eight and, you know, they don't really need transplant, so we can delist them there. Um, so just some waitlist statistics. So this is a graph over time. This is years. Um, the SRTR is a um, scientific registry of transplant recipients, and they do um, annual data reports from the, the year, two years preceding. So the 2019 one is going to come out probably in the spring. So this is the most up-to-date that we have, but you have um, inactive in green and then um, all and active. So basically um, over time, we're referring and listing more patients versus um, over, this is again, over time, um, the total number of patients that are, are listed is essentially um, stable. So um, as we're listing more, we're transplanting more. So th this graph hasn't really changed significantly. Um, but there is a, so we have about give or take um, 13,000 patients on the wait list um, at any given time in, in a year. Um, and you can see that, we're, you know, we're doing about five to six to 7,000 transplants per year. So there's a big gap. There's about 10,000 people or so that are not getting transplanted. And this is kind of steady over time. Um, and then this is just a um, three-year outcomes of um, patients on the wait list. So you have um, in purple, that they're, they're, they're still waiting. And then kind of crossing this and mirroring it is in this aqua blue is um, people that have, have gotten a deceased donor transplant. You have um, a living donor transplant. That's this kind of brownish one. Um, and then 
either removed as green or, or dyed um, kind of similar in pink. So this is kind of um, the three-year outcome. So in three years, about half these patients, a little more than half are transplanted. Um, about 20% are removed, about 12% died, and about 10% are still waiting at three years. Um, this is kind of just a distribution of, of the number of patients waiting on the wait list based on um, etiology. So we have in pink alcoholic liver disease. So you can see this has um, been uptrending in the most um, you know, past five years versus um, hep C is, should be this one, this kind of this greenish um, one is, is going down and that's due to DAA. So the, this is kind of really falling off. Um, you know, this other includes NASH, which is another major cause of, of being referred for transplant. So this is also going up as, as Americans um, with the um, obesity epidemic. Um, and then this is just based on, um, oh, sorry. Um, this is just the, uh, um, the um, kind of year of listing based on um, severity. So kind of MELD um, 15 to 34, MELD greater than 35, and um, status 1A. And so you can see that um, the number of months that these higher MELD and, and status 1A patients are listed is you know, less than one versus um, um, lower melds. Um, but that, so, and the median is about 11 months, um, like all cause, but it varies widely based on whether they're status 1A, which is acute liver failure or meld, and then also where they live as well. So how to, how to organ offers and allocation actually work. So it's based on the severity of illness as well as where they are re relative to the donor hospital. And the point of that is so that the sickest and the closest patients have early access. Organs are allocated only by meld and blood type, un unlike heart, liver, or sorry, um, heart, lung, and uh, kidney, they use HLA. We just use um, meld and blood type. Um, there are some nuances about type B and for a ALF that you don't really need to um, worry about, but there are some kind of, um, you know, um, nuances with that. And then also the, the size of the graft and the size of the recipient. So you can't, you know, put a, a liver from a five foot zero size patient into a recipient that is, you know, six foot six. That's not, that's going to be too small. And you also can't really cut it. It's not like a mango or like a, you know, a cantaloupe or something where you can just kind of trim it to make it fit. So the, the caveat is also, um, an issue. So if it's too large, then you're going to have, um, issues with the recipient size. So you have to um, figure out kind of um, what, what size you're looking for. And then also by the donor characteristics and graph quality, which we'll talk about. Um, organs, so the old system um, up until last year, so we had regions that are um, basically kind of arbitrary based on more or less these follow state lines, not exactly, um, but we were in region two. Uh, so we West Virginia, PA, um, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, DC. Um, and this here on the right is a graph of the median MELD score um, for deceased donor liver transplant based on region. So the, the dark areas, the kind of the higher MELD greater than 35, and then as it kind of gets pale or lower MELD. So you can see this is very um, heterogeneous and you know, there's parts of Florida that are, are very low MELD, um, you know, California and um, New England, you're kind of, um, really stuck if you have a low meld and, and kind of everything in between. Um, and so this was, this was leading to significant kind of variations. And this was why we used to refer people for dual listing, particularly um, if they were in a different region. So if you live in Pittsburgh and you're kind of um, in the western half of, um, of Pennsylvania in region two, and you get dual listed in region 10 and region 11, that would be very helpful because you're pooling from now three different um, regions as far as organ offers. And so that was why we used to do it more. Now we have a new system um, that just started last year, right around a year ago. And this is the concentric circles. So it's based on where the donor hospital is relative to the um, recipient transplant center. So this is an example of um, uh, Tennessee, this is where the donor is, and the first circle is 150, then 250, and then the widest one is, is 500. This is pretty nuanced. Um, it kind of depends on the MELD score. Um, it's like exactly kind of um, goes to the highest MELD 37 first, and if, it, if there's no one in, within the um, widest circle with that, then it goes to 33 and, and so on. So it's, it's a little bit different. But the point of this is 
trying to allocate livers to the sickest patients first, rather than having them be kind of in regions based on arbitrary lines. So if, again, if your patient is in Pittsburgh and they're listed there and there's an organ in Cleveland, you know, two hours away, they're not going to get that organ offer, even though they're geographically closer than maybe someone in, in Michigan that's, you know, that might be a six hour drive away. So there was actually some lawsuits um, and, and um, you know, litigation for patients basically saying they were being discriminated against by, by their location and the, um, rather, and the um, location rather than um, illness severity was determining this. And so this is why that was changed. So the, this, this works in general, you know, sicker patients get transplanted first, but the problem is, is that your um, lower male patients are not going to get as many organs. So if you shift this Tennessee um, city to Washington, DC and put us in the middle of this concentric circle, you're going to be up. Th these, these circles are going to go stretching into New York City, um, Boston. Previously, we didn't have, they were in a different region than us. And so we didn't have to worry about sharing organs with these cities. And now we do. And so that's, that's an issue because, you know, um, just based on, on population statistics, most of our organs are going to be sent that way rather than staying um, in, our, in our own um, region. So you know, it's, it's supposed to be more fair, but it, it has made it a little bit harder um, on, on certain cities. And I think we're one of the ones that has um, not really benefited from this. Um, the, the caveat is that, oops, sorry. Um, we, when we do have higher meld patients, you know, most of our inpatients, we are getting um, organs from centers that we never would have gotten. So like places like Georgia and, and such, um, we can get organs now from. So, you know, there's always two sides to the equation, but, um, I think many of us wish we could go back. How it works. So the, um, the organ procurement um, um, agency calls the, it's generally they're, they're nurse coordinators and then they, they review it with the surgeon. The surgeon will accept or decline. Then the family's notified. They can say yes or no. They have to be about four hours less away. If they're, you know, eight hours, that's not going to work in terms of donor OR. They get COVID tested. If they're the primary recipient, they'll be admitted um, to the surgery service. Um, the donor graft is procured. Um, sometimes our surgeons go, it kind of depends on the situation. They can reject the organs at the last minute, um, but if they accept them, then they, they fly them in here. They have the, the patient is NPO in the hospital, the OR is ready on hold. Then they'll also do backup patients where patients are told that they're backup, meaning that they are not the primary recipient. Um, but if there's any kind of last minute issues, like let's say the recipient's on low dose pressors and in the last two hours now they're on high dose pressors and they're too ill or or something where they realize that the the liver um may not fit as well and and you know they don't want to just throw away an organ and say oh well it's you know too late like we didn't have anyone else ready and so that's why they do backups um so depending on the situation they'll either be at home or um in the hospital um and then they're they're um basically either released um, or, or, you know, um, discharged from the hospital or, or just told, okay, like you're, you can eat again and you're released if the primary gets the organ. And if they, if it doesn't, then they're, they, they would receive it. So um, often when we have ALF patients, again, these patients are very, very unstable and can, you know, kind of change in a matter of hours, malignancy cases, um, um, or if we're kind of second or third in line, then you know, we know that 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 organ's likely going somewhere else. But if for some reason that center rejects it, then we want to have someone you know ready for it. Um, there's different types of organ quality, so extended criteria donors. So these are just um, kind of suboptimal or less than perfect graphs. So um, donors from Hep B or Hep C, older donors, donation after cardiac death, fatty livers. Um, or donors that are increased risk. This is very individualized um, amongst centers and then amongst um, surgeons and, and patients. It really depends on the recipient characteristic and kind of the overall characteristics of the donors. Um, as far as increased risk donors, all donors are screened for viral hepatitis and hep HIV. Um, they can test negative if they're in the um, eclipse period, where, which is when the um, RNA or, or DNA is, is negative despite infection. Window is the antibody. Um, and so they have this increased risk donor, which is trying to kind of identify um, 
kind of at-risk donors that may um, be more likely to transmit an infection. And that can be up to 20% of, of donors. So patients, the recipients are told about this and they can, they can say yes or no that they would accept that. And then if they do, then they get tested for viral hepatitis three and 12 months post-transplant. Um, this is just kind of the guidelines on what's considered um, high risk. So generally IV drug use and then kind of high risk sexual behavior. Um, um, or if you can't get a history, like if, if the donor is unconscious and you can't find anyone that knows them and they, they don't know, then they would consider them high risk. Um, increased risk has some stigma and um, often patients will say no, they're afraid. Sometimes we have to call them and explain what that means. Um, and so a lot of organs were getting thrown out because of that. So now they're going to eliminate that. Um, and basically the, the recipient would still be notified if the donor has kind of behaviors of, of risk, um, but they're, they're not actually calling them that anymore. And as a result, all recipients are going to be tested um, for, for viral um, transmission. As far as donor viral exposure, so hep C, um, we will use antibody positive and RNA um, uh, positive, kind of depending on the, on the um, situation. It's center specific. Some, some centers don't do it, a lot of caveats. If we do use an RNA positive, then we treat the recipient early in their post-transplant um, course, we cure them. But the graft, we have to make sure that the graft doesn't have any fibrosis. Hep B, if they are currently infected, absolutely not. Um, those patients will universally be reinfected. Um, if they are core antibody positive, meaning they've been um, exposed previously, then yes, um, but the recipient has to get lifelong prophylaxis. And then HIV, um, you can transplant, there's something called the HOPE Act. Um, the, if the recipient is HIV infected, then they can get an HIV positive donor. Um, this is very, very specific. There's a lot of different criteria and only certain centers can, are, are qualified to do this. Then you have a, a, there's something called a donor risk index. And this is just basically looking at kind of the um, age of the donor, how they do died, um, like kind of trauma as opposed to like stroke, that type of thing. Um, the, the race of the donor, DCD is donation after cardiac death, um, height and weight of the donor, and then cold ischemia time. And all of these things can be calculated into a donor risk. So one is good as, it, as you um, get into kind of um, less optimal donors, the, the score will go up. The transplant itself will we'll kind of move through this quickly. Um, basically, the recipient um, is getting their hepatectomy and the, um, a different surgical team in the same room is doing the back table prep of the graft, just make, like, getting it kind of anatomically ready. They anastomose the hepatic veins, then the IVC, then the portal vein. Again, knowing if someone has a portal vein thrombosis is important, but if there's a new um, undiscovered one, they can do a thrombectomy. Sometimes I'll have to do a, a, a conduit. Um, this is also when HBIG is given for um, hep B infected patients when they're anhepatic. Then you have reperfusion. So it's basically uncross clamping the IVC and letting the liver um, um, get its blood. That is very, very stressful, particularly for anesthesia. Um, this is when patients are most likely to die. You can get severe hyperkalemia, bradycardia, um, uh, PEAs, a lot of electrolyte issues, um, bleeding, that type of thing. And then once reperfusion is done, then they, then they do the artery, the bile duct, they do um, the, um, any drains. Sometimes they'll do hernia repairs, kind of depending on the situation. It can take six to 12 hours, depending on the surgeon, depending on the patient, how bad their portal hypertension is. Um, I'm going to skip through this in the interest of time. There's just different ways that you can do kind of anastomoses and, and things. Um, the one thing I will highlight is having a RU and Y hepatic as opposed to kind of a, a this is kind of the standard duct to duct you know, the ducts are anastomose end to end. This um, will do for living donors, for PSC, or if they have ductal disease, or if there's a size mismatch. And this is important just in terms of managing them if they have problems long-term um, with, with the um, anastomosis um, and the, the, the bile duct, knowing that they have a, a roux um, can make an ERCP a lot harder because they have to go all the way around and up through rather than kind of conventional. Um, the peri transplant, so they get um, solumedrol induction and then sometimes stimulect as well if they have AKI, HBIG if needed. They're on the surgery um, service at this point. They're getting labs frequently. 
they're started on oral prednisone um, and then prograph mycophenolate and then um, infectious prophylaxis. Usually they're exudated in the first um, one to seven days. Um, they're getting labs initially um, frequently, then daily. They should be de uh, down trending. They're, they're taught on kind of medication adherence. And usually they stay in the hospital like four to eight days, kind of depends on the patient and how sick they were pre-transplant. Complications, I'm going to kind of skip through. Um, these are generally managed by the surgical team, particularly early on, so we'll skip them. Um, the post-transplant timeline, so again, the, the first few days, they're, they're um, kind of getting um, recovering and, and getting back um, on their feet, getting discharged. Their, their staples are removed at 21 days, then they're just kind of working on um, recovering, um, increasing their stamina um, around two to three months, they can start driving again, doing light exercise. Usually three months, um, they can return to work kind of depending, um, heavier exercise, cautious travel, as long as they can be, you know, reached. Around six months is when they get dental cleanings and when vaccines are, are more likely to be effective. And that's when we start HCC surveillance. And then 12 months is more when we switch more to kind of chronic, um, like kind of, um, uh, preventative type care. So malignancy screenings, that type of thing. This is also when we would start doing elective surgery. So if someone needs like their shoulder done or, or that type of thing, doing that type of thing then. And then also pregnancy, um, we usually ask them to wait for uh, 12 months. Um, the first year they're in clinic where, again, it's, it's mainly focusing on the graph. They're getting frequent labs, frequent office visits, their immune suppression is high. Um, and the main risk of mortality is, is from the graft itself and then infections. More than a year, we're kind of managing, um, again, you can have acute or chronic complications um, from the graft. Um, they're on lower maintenance immunosuppression, less frequent labs. And then we, again, focus more on, on um, routine healthcare and kind of the, the larger mortality risks. And then finally, just going into um, kind of post-transplant outcomes. Sorry, I think I'm a little bit over. Um, a uh, number of transplants is going up, um, particularly, um, these are just uh, different volumes based on diagnosis. Um, survival is overall very good and similar between deceased and living donor. Um, graph survival by diagnosis is pretty much the same regardless. Graph survival by meld and status, essentially the same. By age, um, there is a drop off in older, older recipients, but in general, these are not um, particularly statistically different. Um, after one year, generally non-graph um, things are kind of the, the larger group and then recurrent disease. Um, recurrence can depend on, on the etiology. Um, PBC, autoimmune, PSC can be higher. Hep B will recur, but we suppress it with antivirals. Hep C, we really don't have an issue with. We just cure it. NASH can be about 50%, um, but they can they don't usually get recurrent cirrhosis. Alcohol, the recidivism rate is very low and less than about 5% of the people that do return to drinking actually have severe graft injury. And then HCC, very low if they're within Milan, but they are um, surveyed for it. Um, there are some things that uh, liver transplant can completely cure. Um, so those are nice. Um, mostly they're pediatric metabolic things. Um, about 90,000 people are alive with a functioning liver transplant right now. How do these people um, meet each other and connect? They, there's American Liver Foundation. Um, um, there's the World Transplant Games. There's Transplant Games of America. So it's basically like um, all, all different types of sporting events that they can do other ways as well. Most centers will have like a um, transplant um, support group um, online or in person. Um, and then the last thing, everyone should be a, um, a, a organ donor, you can benefit eight solid organ recipients. You're more likely to need an organ than to actually become an organ donor, like meaning not that you register, but you, you actually donate an organ at the time of your death. You're, you're 6.2 times more likely if you're a man and 5.5 times more likely if you're a woman to need an organ than to actually give one. 95% of patients are of Americans are in favor of being a donor, but only 58% are registered. So encourage people to register.